Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. Let's talk some more about the day of the Lord. I'm going to show you something really cool in the book of Joel as far as how to understand those three chapters. And I want to focus in on the rapture teaching of a pastor who is very popular, who I enjoy listening to very much. He is a very knowledgeable. He's been doing great work for the Lord for many decades now. And, uh, and I really enjoy listening to him. But I want to show you the mistake that he is making in regards to the timing of the rapture. And it's the same mistake that many other great men of God who are very popular and who have very large followings, they're making the same mistake. So I don't do this short study to try to discourage you from listening to John MacArthur or uh, Pastor Jeremiah, for example, or the Perry Stones or, or any other brother or sister. Everyone's got a piece of the puzzle and Father wants us to, to create the puzzle using all of the uh, individual pieces. So we have a good understanding of what's going to go down during these last seven years of the age prior to the appearing of Jesus Christ. And these seven years are called the 70th week of Daniel. So you're going to hear me mention Pastor John MacArthur's name, but I do it in a loving way. I'm trying to help him because he's close. He's close to understanding the timing of the rapture, but there's something that's thrown him off. I see a spelling error right here I'm going to have to uh, uh, fix before I upload this short study. But let's get right into it. Pastor John MacArthur from uh, Grace, Grace to You, I think, is the name of the ministry. Uh, very popular. I love his teachings on many things. Um, and in regards to the 70th week of Daniel, there's one aspect of it that he really nails, and he's one of the best teachers to listen to concerning it, and that is understanding how um, characters in the Quran, such as the Mahdi, um, the prophet Jesus, which is not the same as the Son of God Jesus, our Lord, and uh, the character named Dajjal, um, he does a very good job of explaining how there's a very high chance, high level probability that those characters are the ones who we call, who the Word of God calls, the man of sin, the false prophet, and so on. So he, th those are great teachings of his, and he has many other great teachings that uh, you need to listen to. Grace to you ministries. Yeah, I see it that I have typed it right here on the short study. But it's real important that you understand where these shepherds who mean well, who are great servants of Almighty God and our Lord Jesus, where they're going wrong in regards to the timing of the rapture. And it's real important that we get it right and correct them. All right, and you may say, who are you, brother, to correct them? Well, whoever has the truth needs to correct your brothers who don't have the truth. It's you you're in the line of 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 Jesus passing passing the baskets of understanding, feeding the poor with the truth. And your job as a servant is to get it from your brother on the right and pass it on down the line to your brother on the left and keep that basket going and keep that food of truth going to the brethren. Hallelujah. So Pastor John of Grace to You Ministries is making the same mistake regarding the rapture timing as hundreds of other well-known, i uh, got to correct that spelling error as well, pastors are making within the body of Christ today. Here's huge mistake number one. These shepherds believe that the wrath of God, or wrath to come, does not begin in any form until Jesus appears. In their thinking, there is not a portion of the day of the Lord that occurs until Jesus appears. That's their first big mistake. Huge mistake number two that they're making. They believe that the saints 
that have Satan making war against them for 42 months are left behind saints that become saved during the day of the Lord. In other words, they believe that when the saints are taken away in the rapture, in the gathering to our Lord, then begins the 42 months of tribulation and Satan making war uh, on the saints. But really, you don't hear shepherds like Pastor John MacArthur talking about that very much. You know, Revelation 12 and 13, the 42 months of Satan making war on the on the, those who have the testimony of Jesus. He doesn't talk about that much. And when he's forced to, he, he you know incorporates that as part of the day of the Lord. And that's all after Jesus appears. That's not true. Huge mistake number three that they make. They do not understand that the wrath of Jesus unleashes on his enemies and adversaries. I should word that a little different. They do not understand that the wrath that Jesus unleashes on his enemies and adversaries during uh, occurs during the early days of the millennium. This war that occurs on the last day of the age at Jesus' appearing and lasts through the first many days of the millennium, that war has a title. and It's not called the Battle of Armageddon. It's called the Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty. So that's their mistakes. Here's what I wish they knew. And this is why I do this, not to try to belittle these great men of God, great servants of our Lord with um, huge followings. This isn't a na 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 na, I know more than you do, ha ha, ha catch up. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm doing this out of love. Time is short. The great falling away is about to take place. Satan is about to be cast to earth. Now, the last seven years of this age has not begun yet. There are things that we should recognize when they happen, then we can say we're in the last seven years of the age. But that hasn't happened yet. Like the peace agreements uh, where Israel's going to sign with their evil neighbors and surrounding peoples. And God gives that peace agreement a title, and he calls it the covenant with death. You read about it in Isaiah 28. It is also Luke, uh, excuse me, Daniel 11:23. Hallelujah. Um, here's what I wish they knew. And here's the beauty of this short study. I'm going to read what I have here in this red box. Then I'm going to take you to Joel 2, the book, um, excuse me, the book of Joel, all three chapters, and show you uh, how God unveils the day of the Lord to us using the three chapters in the book of Joel. One, and it's real easy to remember. Once I show you this, it's going to be really easy to remember uh, what Father is telling us in Joel, the book of Joel, all three chapters, and how he wants us to teach it to the brethren. It's really neat. You're going to like this. But let's first, where are they going wrong in regards to the rapture timing and the day of the Lord? What I wish they knew... A, that the day of the Lord comes in two phases. Very few people acknowledge that and understand that. But when I take you to Joel, you're going to go, and I also take you to the sixth seal passage of Revelation 6. When I take you to these two places, and there's other places I can take you, Isaiah 13, verse 13, and, and there's others, Isaiah 2. But when I take you to these just two locations, you're going to be like, Yep, I see it now. There are literally two phases to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the wrath has come, right? But it's, it's two phases, and the wrath is appointed to two different groups of people. You'll see what I mean. So that they don't know that the day of the Lord comes in two phases. They just think it's one phase, and it happens when Jesus appears. That's not the case. When Jesus appears, that's the day of Christ. That's phase two to the day of the Lord. It is the day of the Lord. To be specifically, it is the day of Christ. But the day of the Lord, not the day of Christ, but the day of the Lord, actually comes way back about three years earlier during the sixth seal. See, the day of Christ doesn't 
happen until the seventh bowl. That's when Jesus appears. That's when his gathering of his uh, sheep to him occurs. The gathering of all that belong to him on the last day, says John, uh, the book of John. Okay. So what's the what are the titles of the two phases? Well, you see it in Revelation 6. I'm getting ready to take you there. The first phase, and again, when I take you to Revelation 6, if I haven't totally sold you, when I take you to Joel, you're going to see it. Again, there's many other places I can take you, like Isaiah 13, 13, which shows it, Isaiah 2, and there's other places. The first phase of the day of the Lord is called the wrath of him who sits on the throne. Okay. Now, God is one. Right? He exists as three persons. God the Father, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Okay? But, so this wrath of God is the day of the Lord, and it starts at the sixth seal. But you don't, you don't uh, move from the wrath of him who sits on the throne into the wrath of the Lamb until the Lamb appears in glory above Jerusalem in the clouds. Then you move into the wrath of the Lamb during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. But you've got seven trumpet judgments on the nation of Israel called the promised curse of the Song of Moses, the curse and the oath of Daniel 9, 1, 1. That is phase one of the day of the Lord. So that's, do you see where they're going wrong? They don't know what to do with the seven trumpet judgments. And if they think Jesus appears to start all of that at the sixth seal, like a mid-trip pre-wrath rapture, they are wrong. The last day of the 70th week of Daniel is not until the it is done is screamed before uh, Jesus descends from heaven in Revelation 16, 17. And you might say, well, what is it that's done? Well, what did the book of Daniel tell you? That 70 weeks are determined to do what? Okay, when you go back to Daniel 9 and you see all of the things Father says he's going to accomplish during these 70 weeks, and most of them are accomplished during the last week of seven years, that's what the it is done is referring to at the end of the sixth bowl passage. It is done, Revelation 16, 17. Now the seventh angel pours the seventh bowl. Now Jesus descends brought by Father and, and appears in glory over Jerusalem. And now you have the gathering of the bride, the presentation of the bride, the official adoption of the bride. Hallelujah. Then Jesus leads his armies and goes out to fight as in the day of battle during the first few days, weeks, months of the millennium, however long it lasts. That's called the battle of the great day of God Almighty when Jesus takes care of the wine press and all of the threshing floors between the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River, says Isaiah 27, 12. Okay. So what is it that I wish they knew? Well, I wish they knew the day of the Lord, the wrath of God, if you will, comes in two phases. The first one, which we'll see in Revelation 6 and all those other places I mentioned, is the wrath of him who sits on the throne. It is the wrath of the Lord of hosts upon his people Israel to do the things Isaiah chapter 1 says needs to be done, to do the things that Daniel 9 says needs to be done. To purge away and take away their iniquities and their transgressions and their dross and their alloy. Right? And then the results of how bad the spanking will be are, is found in Zechariah 13. And it's not pretty. It is the sixth seal through the sixth bowl. That's phase one of the day of the Lord. Now, the second thing I wish they knew. That the second phase of the day of the Lord is called the wrath of the Lamb. we got to get these titles straight. And that it begins at the seventh bowl. Doesn't begin at the sixth seal. Jesus does not appear until the it is done is screamed and accomplished and done. Then you have the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty when Jesus 
appears above Jerusalem and sits to judge the living and the dead. That's when you have the worst earthquake of all time, says Revelation chapter uh, 16, verses 17 through 21. 100 pound hailstones. All right. The wine press. And, and then he goes out and threshes all of the threshing floors in the Middle East. And you see the hit list to include all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth found in the second half of Jeremiah 25. It is the wrath of the Lamb. It is the wrath of Jesus on all the wicked who have taken the mark of the man of sin or even bowed before his image. It is against all who have come against either of his two flocks or against his holy city Jerusalem. And the third thing that I wish they knew, that the 42-month war of Satan against those who have the testimony of Jesus, everyone likes to read over that and act like that's not going to happen. It is, and, and begins during the fifth seal arrival of Satan and ends at the seventh trumpet blast. That verdict of Daniel 7, verses 25 through 27. Right? When the kingdom has been awarded to Jesus and the saints of the Most High. See, the performance of the saints of the Most High, that's you, church, is needed so that Father can reach his verdict of Daniel 7 at the seventh trumpet. Now, what did uh, Pastor John MacArthur and other pastors, a lot of them, who are making this rapture timing mistake, what is it that they, they get right? Well, that the rapture does occur when Jesus appears in glory in the clouds above Jerusalem. They get that right, but they don't understand that it's on the last day of the seven-year period, which will be shortened for a little bit for the sake of the elect. Now, let's go to the, the Word of God that I've been talking about. Let's start with Revelation 6. This is the start to the wrath of God called the day of the Lord. This is what the contents of the scroll is. We like to say, well, when the scroll is open, the kingdom of God has come. Oh, no. No. First, you have to accomplish those things in Daniel 9. We're getting ready to go there and remind you of what they are. To do this, to do that. Those have to be accomplished first. And the book of Revelation says they're not accomplished at the sixth seal. They're not accomplished until, until Revelation 16, 17, after the sixth, sixth bowl period is finished and the seventh angel pours the seventh bowl on the last day of the age. Now, when you read this, this is talking about the day of the Lord. Okay? And don't get hung up on each particular verse because the day of the Lord, anything that happens during the day of the Lord can be uh, mentioned here in this passage because this passage isn't talking about all of these things happening in a 12-hour day or a 24-hour day. This is talking about the day of the Lord, sixth seal, seventh seal, all seven trumpets, okay, all the way till the seventh bowl is poured. Anything that happens during that approximately three-year period can be put in here because this is describing the day of the Lord. Now, when you get down, this is important, when you get down here, uh, let's read uh, 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from. Now you're getting ready to see the official titles, as far as God is concerned, of phase one of the day of the Lord and phase two of the day of the Lord. Phase one of the day of the Lord, which is the seven trumpet judgment curse on Israel, his people, to do X, Y, and Z. Here it is. The face of him who sits on the throne. That's your seven trumpet judgment curse to accomplish things with the nation of Israel. Then here's the separation. And here is the official title of phase two which does not begin until Jesus appears in glory at the seventh bowl, all right, on the last day of the age. When he appears, now he is king, and he can sit and judge, right, and render his vengeance on his enemies and adversaries during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. See, people think that the battle of the great day of God Almighty is fought during the um, seven trumpet judgments. 
Well, it is at the seventh bowl, but since the last day of the age starts the wrath of the Lamb, you, then it would more correct to say um, the wrath of the Lamb, even though it begins on the last day of the age, which I believe it begins in the last hour or two of the last day, at twilight evening time, it shall happen, says uh, um, Zechariah 14, 7 and Isaiah 17, 14. Zechariah 14, 7, Isaiah 17, 14. All right. So those, those are your two official titles. Before we go to other chapters that I've mentioned, this is the New King James Version wording. The King James Version is the same. But I'll just give you one more example of how they word it. Who should we pick? In other words, whatever version of the Bible you use, look at Revelation 6 and see the two official, official titles of the day of the Lord based on your version of the Bible. The NIV. Let's see how the NIV calls, calls the two phases of the day of the Lord. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So that didn't help because it's identical to the King James Version and the New King James Version. I'll just try one more. I really don't know if it's different or not, but I'm, I know some are. Uh, let's go with the NASB, New American Standard Bible. Just out of curiosity, does it use the same two titles? From the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So it doesn't. So that's interesting. Very few versions of the Bible, Bible title it anything different. Now, if you go to Isaiah 13, 13, which you heard me mention, is another place that lists the two titles of the day of the Lord. These are official titles. Um, Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place. In other words, they're shaking at the sixth seal, says Joel 2, ahead of Gog the Assyrian's army. And then there's the worst earthquake of all time ahead of Jesus' army, which you are a part of, amen, at the seventh bowl. And there's other shakings going on as well. At the fury, oh, we're in uh, what? The NA, excuse me, NASB right now. And the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. See, I don't like this NASB here because it doesn't have the and separating them. Right? This is correct. It's the Lord of hosts is phase one of the day of the Lord. Right? It's the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people, this people Israel, the promised curse and the oath of the Song of Moses. And then, um, during the wrath of the Lamb, uh, the day of his indignation, here the NASB calls the wrath of the Lamb in the day of his burning anger, right? That refiner's fire that comes out of the nostrils of Jesus Christ, says Isaiah 30, right? And Isaiah 33. So that's how the NASB words it. You, you see now why I love the uh, New King James Version, which is almost identical to the King James Version. I prefer it better than say something like this because you don't see a clear separation of phase one and phase two and things like this has caused people not to understand that there's two phases. But when you go back to the New King James Version or the King James Version, it makes it much easier to see the separation. Remember the and in the Revelation 6, 6 seal passage? Well, here it is again. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts. This is what, this is another title for phase one, right? The wrath of him who sits on the throne is how it's worded in the six seal passage. Talking about the Lord of hosts, right? Who sits on the throne. And here's that and that separates the two phases, just like it did in the six seal passage. It does it here in Isaiah 13. In the day of his fierce anger, which is talking about the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, you've got to combine the six seal passage with Isaiah 13. 
Now let's look at, uh, before we go, I'll save Joel for last. That's the cool part. Let's go to, um, Daniel 9. These are all the things that have to be accomplished before Father is going to bring Jesus. Okay? What is, what's the uh, purpose of the 70 weeks of years? Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. 70 weeks of years. Here we go. All right, what are all the things that have to uh, be accomplished before the it is done of Revelation 16, 17 can be screened? Here it is. For your people and for your holy city, talking about Israel and Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Messiah, Jesus, not the Muslim version of Jesus, just a prophet, a man, but the real Jesus, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, who died, who was raised from the dead after three days. Hallelujah. To anoint the most holy, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. So these are all the things that the wrath of him who sits on the throne, that's how it's referred to in the sixth seal passage, and in, in the New King James Version, it's called the wrath of the Lord of hosts uh, in Isaiah 13. That's phase one of the day of the Lord. And then when the it is done is screened, let's go to Revelation 16. Right here. After six bowls have been poured, now it's time to pour the seventh bowl. Boom! It is done! And here comes Father bringing Jesus on the cherub of Ezekiel chapter 1. <clears throat> when are all those things done? There. Not at the sixth seal. Okay? These things right here. They're not accomplished and done until the curse has been, uh, or you can say Israel has undergone the curse for seven trumpet judgments. You shouldn't wish it on them. You shouldn't wish that Father spanks them hard. Just the opposite. You should be praying on their behalf, pleading your case before the Lord. Have mercy on your people. Have mercy, Father. Okay, You don't encourage Father's wrath. You stand in the gap like Moses did. But Father's not going to stop spanking until all these things are accomplished. He has no choice. He has to. <clears throat> and Israel will be left a remnant. A meek, mild remnant who will offer precious sacrifices to Father as Jesus reigns during the millennium. Hallelujah. All right, now we're ready to go to the book of Joel. If you've never quite understood the day of the Lord passage in the book, three chapters of the book of Joel, now you're going to understand it. Okay, chapter one is all about the warnings to Israel and why father is going to bring. Okay, it's, it's father pleading his case during the fifth seal period. <clears throat> Here's what you've done wrong. Here's why you've got me so mad. Here's why I've got to bring the promised curse on the last generation of Israel during this age. Why I've got to do it. It's, it's like a prelude to the seven trumpet judgments or phase one of the day of the Lord, right? Father is warning them, here's what I'm going to do and why. Now, pay attention to the number of these verses. Joel 2 is the start at the sixth seal to the day of the Lord. Remember, it begins with the wrath of him who sits on the throne, which is also called the wrath of the Lord of hosts upon his people. 
It's also called the curse. It has a few different names. Phase one of the day of the Lord, right? But look, it's verses 1 through 17. Do you see that? 1 through 17 is phase 1 of the day of the Lord. And then when you come to the last chapter of the book of Joel, chapter 3, which is also still talking about the day of the Lord, now verses 1 through 17 is phase 2 of the day of the Lord. Do you see how God did that? <clears throat> I've never heard anyone <clears throat> even acknowledge that they noticed that before. I'm not saying other people haven't, but I'm the dimmest bulb in the pack. So why aren't other people noticing these things? Maybe it's because it's just now becoming unsealed. I don't know why. <clears throat> but people need to pick up on things like this. Okay? Verses 1 through 17 of Joel 3 is phase 2 of the day of the Lord, which starts at the seventh bowl appearing the last day of the age of Jesus Christ to render his vengeance on his enemies and adversaries. All right, and the first thing he does is muster his army for battle. That is the resurrection to life of Ezekiel 37 and the rapture of First and Second Thessalonians. Okay, he's going to start with gathering the nations. That's the sixth bowl passage, and then boom, as soon as they're in place, Jesus appears in glory and begins to go out and fight as in the day of battle. So, again, what's Joel 1? What Father is about to do and why? You could call it a prelude to um, the wrath of him who sits on the throne against his people. Now, Joel 2, you have phase 1 of the day of the Lord. Sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl. There it is. 17 verses. Now, what you have at the tail end of Joel 2 is a prelude to the millennium. No, let me take that back. The end of Joel 2 is a prelude to Joel 3. What he's going to do, what Jesus is going to do, after all the things have, are done and accomplished as far as the dealings with Israel, Right? I will remove far from you that northern army. Okay? That's Jesus is going to remove that army. He's going to go out and fight against them in Joel 3. So this is a prelude to Joel 3. It's a prelude to phase 2 of the day of the Lord. Okay? First 17 verses is phase 2 of the day of the Lord, the seven trumpet judgments. And then, boom, you have the prelude to... Joel 3's phase 2 of the day of the Lord. Now you go to Joel 3 and, and boom, 17 verses. Just like Joel 2, but these 17 verses is when Jesus appears at the seventh bowl and now goes out to fight the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now he's going to plunder those who plundered his people. Right? There's Matthew 24, sign in the sun and moon and stars. And then what happens at the end of Joel 3 is the prelude to the millennium. See? Did you see that? Verses 18 through 21, prelude to the millennium. In Joel 2, verses 18 through 20... Uh, to 32. 18 to 32 is the prelude to Joel 3. And then at the end of Joel 3 is the prelude to the millennium. So always remember in the book of Joel that phase one of the day of the Lord, the seven trumpet judgment curse on Israel is verses 1 through 17. You got it? Boom, there it is. And that Joel 3 is phase two of the day of the Lord after Jesus appears at the seventh bowl, and that is also 17 verses. Got it? So what's Joel 2 doing? It's the seven trumpet judgment curse. But Joel 2 
is primarily talking about the sword portion of the curse. Because when Father brings the curse on his people during the seven trumpet judgments, he's not only bringing the sword of war, but he's bringing other things like famine and pestilence and wormwood and that sort of thing. So Joel 2 is about the sword portion of the curse, the seven trumpet judgments, six seal through the end of the sixth bowl. Okay, this is the sword portion. This is this northern army that Jesus is going to remove at the seventh bowl out of the land. The land is like a garden of Eden before them. Why? Because we're talking about the sixth seal, not the seventh bowl. Because by the time the seventh bowl is poured, Isaiah 14 says the Antichrist is going to be successful in making the world a wilderness. Isaiah 14 says that. So Israel is not going to look like the Garden of Eden on the day Jesus appears at the seventh bowl. This is the end. The time of the end has come upon my people suddenly of Amos 8. All right, in, in 1 Thessalonians, this is the day of the Lord that comes like a thief in the night, talking about phase one. And then when Jesus comes in phase two of the day of the Lord, it found in Joel 3, this is, behold, I am coming as a thief. Okay, behold, I am coming as a thief is phase two of the day of the Lord. And then the passages about the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. That starts at the sixth seal. That's talking about the curse, the promised curse of the Song of Moses on the people of Israel. So two phases to the day of the Lord. Man, if we can get people to understand that, they would stop going wrong by three years on their timing of the rapture or seven years uh, on their timing of the rapture. Based on whether they're pre-trib or mid-trib, Post-trib is the answer. It's the correct answer to the rapture. But you, when you say post-trib pre-wrath, you've got to educate on whoever it is you're talking to on what wrath you mean. When you say I am post-trib pre-wrath, pre-wrath what? Are you talking about the wrath of the Lord of hosts, him who sits on the throne against his people? Or are you talking about the wrath of the Lamb against his adversaries and enemies? Which wrath are you talking about? So the correct answer, brothers and sisters, to the question, when is the rapture? All right, the correct answer is it's a post-trib, pre-wrath of the Lamb rapture. So when John MacArthur, right, when shepherds like John MacArthur say, um, Jesus is going to rapture us to him and, and change us into immortal beings and rescue us prior to the wrath of God, well, he would be right if he gave more specifics and said the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus is going to rapture us before he unleashes the wrath of the Lamb. But what shepherds don't understand is Phase one of the day of the Lord. That's what starts at the sixth seal passage. That's the curse on Israel, the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the wrath of him who sits on the throne, right? Against his people, this people Israel. You got it? So help me, brothers and sisters, teach the brethren and... There's a lot of shepherds that just aren't open to the truth. And they've sold a lot of books. And it's tempting not to study it any further. They really believe. They really believe that we're not going to be here for the phase one of the day of the Lord. They don't even realize it comes in two phases. And they don't even want to talk about Revelation 12 and 13 that talks about Satan being cast to earth and making war on those who have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. I guess they think that's some people that become saved in Israel after we're gone. But didn't you not read the part where it says it lasts for 42 months? 
I guess they think Jesus is going to rapture the church out of here at the sixth seal. And then all of the second half, uh, the only people who are going to do what they need to do to enable Father to reach his verdict of Daniel 7, verses 25 through 27, are a few Israeli little girls who come to the knowledge of Jesus during the 42-month period. But they're wrong. We're all going to be here. In fact, we must wait patiently on our Lord until the day he rises up for plunder. That's not talking about waiting on God the Father only and not Jesus. No. You have to wait on your Lord Jesus until the day he rises up for plunder during the wrath of the Lamb, battle of the great day of God Almighty at the seventh bowl, in the first early days or weeks of the millennium. The threshing of all the threshing floors. Brothers and sisters, 2 Thessalonians 2 is talking to you, not the few uh, Israeli girls who during the war on them become saved after we're gone. No, no, no. Jesus told you on the last day. I'm coming for you on the last day. You wait patiently. All right? And labor hard and keep the faith. Now, Jesus did say, if you watch, and you watch, and you know when to flee evil in time, then you may be accounted worthy to escape those things that are coming upon the earth. What's that talking about? Revelation 12, place prepared by God. Okay, and there's probably other places besides the Judean wilderness. The Bible doesn't say. But there's probably other places of safety on other continents where little packs of, of believers can get together and hide and be self-sufficient. All right, brothers and sisters. I hope this lesson on the timing of the rapture has been a blessing to you. I hope you have a better understanding of uh, uh, the book of Joel like never before. Spread the word on those 17 verses of Joel 2 and the 17 verses of Joel 3. Spread the word, brothers and sisters. Uh, the great falling away is coming, but we do not want that to involve any one of our beloved family members or friends. Can you fall away from Jesus if the Holy Spirit resides in you? No, I don't think so. But what if you're a member of the church and Father hasn't sent you his spirit? There's going to be a lot of proclaiming church members who are going to fall away during the 42 months of Satan making war and using strong delusion. Uh, I'll end with this. I do think Pastor John MacArthur is right when he says there's a high chance that the false prophet is actually going to be a man who proclaims to be Jesus based on the Koran. I think he's right when he says that. I think he's right when he says that the uh, Koran's Mahdi is actually the final Antichrist man of sin, Gog the Assyrian. I think he's right. He's got all that stuff right. He just doesn't understand phase one and phase two of the day of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I hope it's been a blessing to you. And until I see you again, God bless.